All right, it looks like we have everyone. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, meeting of December 6th. Uh, today we have three agenda items. <clears throat> we have the Green Mountain Care Board staff analysis of One Care's fiscal year 24 budget, and we have potential votes noticed on the Medicare only ACO fiscal year 24 budgets for Lower Health and Vitalize uh, Health 9. Um, our health policy project director, Michelle Sawyer, and our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, will lead those presentations. And we'll have public comment um, after the One Care presentation and then a second round after the Lower Health and Vitalize presentations. Um, I'll turn to uh, our executive director, Susan Barrett, for her report. Mr. Chair, wanted to remind folks about some public comment periods we have open right now. And also just to remind everyone that we accept public comments 365 days a year, but we do take the opportunity to make special public comments so that the public can share their um, their views with the board ahead of a decision or a vote. So um, a new one that we just posted yesterday was um, the Brattleboro Retreats uh, budget submission. This is a new duty for the board and that they have their FY24 hospital budget review and material um, materials that are posted on the board. And we'll be reviewing that um, at a, uh, when, on Wednesday, December 20th. We ask that folks um, share those comments um, so that they can be uh, reviewed by the board. Uh, and if you could get those in by December 18th. If you get them in a little later, that's okay, but we are trying to get have a time limit so the board can see those before they make their decisions. Um, we also have an ongoing public uh, comment period for One Care Vermont ACO budget submission and certification. And um, we would like to have those public comments into us by Friday, December 15th, so that the board can have those before their potential vote, which is scheduled for December 20th. And then we have two ongoing um, public comment periods on um, some work we're doing at the state. The first one is the uh, Act 167 community engagement work. We finished up our first round of virtual uh, engagement meetings um, and getting ready to go back out later this uh, next year, early spring to to uh, meet with community members in person, but we are accepting any public comments on that work. And again, thank everyone, um, providers and the public for your robust participation in that work. And then lastly, we are accepting public comments on a next potential all-payer model with CMS. Any of the comments that we receive, we share with AHS, Agency of Human Services, as they are leading the negotiations on that model and the work on the current model. And I just also remind folks to just check out our website for um, meetings. We have a couple of days that are starting early today. Um, so just be aware of that. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, there may be times I have to go off camera i've lost my temporary office that i was using and my internet might be a little um iffy at times so if i do that's that's why i apologize it helps with the bandwidth um we have meeting minutes from november 29th 2023 is there a motion to approve the minutes so moved second all those in favor please say aye 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 aye, aye. And the minutes are unanimously approved. Um, and uh, is Michelle Sawyer here? Yes, I am. Hey, good morning. Um, remind me, are we doing One Care first or the Medicare only ACOs? Yes, we're looking at One Care this morning. Okay, great. All right. Um, so the staff today will go through the presentation that they have in their analysis of the budget and the information we've been receiving over the last month or so. Um, and uh, the board, I think, will vote on this. I think around December 20th is when we're planning on it. Um, the staff will have a series of options for the board to consider and, and think about uh, in advance of that, which I think will be at the end of this presentation today. 
Um, so thank you, Michelle and Russ and your team and Angela for all your great work on this. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. All right, let's dive in. So here's the agenda for this morning. Um, we'll do an introduction and background. We'll touch on some public comment that we've received to date. And then we'll get into the good stuff. We'll look at One Care Vermont's budget. Um, we'll look at their budget targets, financial and performance review. And as uh, Chair Foster mentioned, there's some options that will be discussed. Um, of course, there'll be time for board questions and discussions as well as public comments. So I'm going to hand it over to Russ to um, to give us an overview of uh, the board's authority when it comes to the oversight of accountable care organizations. <clears throat> um, thank you, Michelle. So I'll speak about um, the board's oversight of uh, ACOs broadly, and then uh, some of the specifics around the review of certified ACOs like One Care Vermont. Um, <clears throat> Generally speaking, the board's ACO oversight breaks down into two different functions. The first is certification, which is required initially for any ACO uh, receiving state Medicaid or commercial payments. Um, that happens once and then it's reviewed on an ongoing basis, um, <clears throat> at least every year, and the staff is uh, working on that process. <clears throat> um, the second is annually, there's a budget review for each ACO, and um, that takes place now in the fall, and uh, the board will uh, vote to modify or approve a budget before the end of the year. Uh, so next slide, Michelle. <clears throat> um, in looking at the budget review for a certified ACO like One Care Vermont, <clears throat> we look to the board's ACO oversight statute, it's ACO oversight rule, and then uh, the all payer model agreement. Um, kind of the specific standards uh, that have been adopted by the board reside in rule 5405, it says for a certified ACO, uh, with more than 10,000 lives in the state. Um, the board will consider any benchmarks established um, <clears throat> under the rule. The criteria listed in um, the statute in B1, I believe there are around 16 different factors listed there. Um, unlike the smaller ACOs, uh, for larger ACOs, the board covers um, the board doesn't have discretion as to which factors it considers. The rule says the board shall consider all the factors. Um, the rule also says the board will consider elements of the uh, payer specific programs and applicable requirements of 9551 or the all payer model uh, agreement. <clears throat> and then lastly, any issues um, at the discretion of the board. Um, and also, as set out in the rule, the ACO has the burden of justifying its proposed budget to the board. Um, I know that all the board members have been through this process before for One Care, but hopefully that's a somewhat useful, if very high level, um, overview of the uh, um, <clears throat> standards in the process set out in the statute and rule. Us. So let's just take a t uh, look at the timeline as far as One Care's budget and certification for FY24. The board issued the uh, budget guidance back in July. We received One Care's certification eligibility verification materials September 1st. Um, and like Russ mentioned, the staff is still working on that. Um, One Care submitted their budget October 2nd. We heard from One Care Vermont on, at their hearing on November 8th, 
And then last week we heard um, from the payers regarding um, 2022 financial settlement and quality performance. And then today we're here to talk about the staff presentation for One, One Care Vermont's budget. Next week, there's the potential for some deliberations on the budget, um, and there will be uh, the FY24 Medicare benchmark presentation. On December 20th, there's time for a potential vote for One Care Vermont's budget, and there's a potential vote on the FY24 Medicare benchmark. And then throughout 2024 and into 2025, the Green Mountain Care Board will monitor uh, FY24 performance against the budget and conditions. So let's look at some public comments. So um, as mentioned by Susan, the um, public comment period is still open. It is open through December 15th, and we welcome uh, any and all public comment. Um, thus far, we've received 12 public comments, and here are some themes that we're seeing. So we hear about the value of One Care's improved health outcomes, higher quality care, lower cost, and enhanced, enhanced coordination of care the value of care coordination and strengthened partnerships with local care organizations. We heard concerns about access to care and long wait times to see providers. We heard about concerns about the cost of healthcare in Vermont and concerns about the effectiveness of One Care, the loss of Blue Cross Blue Shield and increasing executive salaries. The healthcare advocate also shared a public comment, which I would like to review. So they asked some questions. They are questioning if One Care is providing sufficient value to Vermonters given its cost. They question whether One Care's approach and place in the overall healthcare reform effort could achieve progress on the goals of the all payer model, and if One Care will be able to help achieve Vermont's healthcare reform goals. <clears throat> They express concerns due to commercial insurance rate increases in Vermont and the fact that it now they now far outpace the national state, uh, the United States average. Um, they're concerned that Vermont's rate of underinsurance among Vermont's privately insured residents has increased from 27.3% to 44%. And Vermont's hospital adjusted expenses per inpatient day are now growing faster than the national average. They expressed they felt there was misrepresentation of the NORC evaluation to the board, the HCA, and the public. They expressed um, concern around declining population health management expenditures while um, it, observing increasing expenditures on consulting and payroll, and concerns about the purpose and benefits of Arcadia. The healthcare advocate provided um, some recommendations to the board. Those three recommendations are request they are requesting that the board reduce One Care's purchased services line by 50% and evenly reallocate those funds to non-hospital owned independent PCPs to improve primary care. The HCA believes that such a change is warranted because One Care has not provided evidence of why this amount is needed. Um, and that there is substantial evidence that independent primary care practices provide high quality and comparatively lower cost. And Vermont has historically underinvested in primary care compared to the rest of the country. They also request that the board and its staff conduct a comparative analysis on uh, of return on investment of One Care's activities to non-Chittenden County-based HSAs compared to Chittenden County HSA. And they request that the Green Mountain Care Board and its staff conduct an analysis of One Care's impact on affordability, health outcomes, and access to help access to help inform whether One Care merits inclusion in any future all-payer model. All right, so we will get into One Care Vermont and the FY24 budget targets. So how, where we've been heading with these targets. So the FY22 and 23 budget order conditions reflected a focus on data-driven monitoring and oversight. There's really a focus on ensuring that the ACO's management drives continuous improvement consistent with high performing ACOs and that it supports achieving the state's health reform goals. This approach continues and it led to the development of the budget targets in the FY24 budget guidance. Um, as Russ mentioned, the board authority to set benchmarks, we use the word target in this case because the term benchmark has several different meanings in this world. Um, but so for uh, clarity, we're calling them targets. 
but this is outlined in Rule 5.402. The board may establish benchmarks for any indicators to be used by ACOs in developing and preparing their proposed budgets. They are really intended to signal to the ACO what the board would like to see in their submitted budget. The board uh, developed seven budget targets for this year, and there were two placeholders that were included as part of their guidance. And here's just a quote to explain <clears throat> how this works. If the ACO's proposed budget varies from the budget target, the board will review the ACO's proposed budget and support for varying from these targets in its FY24 budget submission using the factors and criteria set out in statute and rule. For all budget targets that are met, the ACO should expect less analysis of the area of the budget from the Green Mountain Care Board and staff. So in other words, these budget targets are not binding. There was no requirement that One Care had to meet any of these uh, targets. There's a lot on this slide, but I wanted to have all of the targets and their status in one place. We will take the time to go through each one. Um, so just briefly, Targets one is at least partially met. We're waiting on additional information. Target two was met. Target three and four were not met. Target five was met. Six and seven were placeholders that did not end up being developed. Eight was met and nine was met. So we'll walk through, we'll start with target one, which is the FY24 commercial benchmark trend rates must be consistent with the ACO attributed population and the Green Mountain Care Board approved rate filings. This target was met um, at least for the MVP payer program um, and it's self-funded is to be determined. So this slide reviews all the payer programs trend and how um, the payer programs trend and benchmarks are set. We're focusing on the MVP and QHP and the self-funded payer programs for the sake of target one. For the MVP QHP, uh, One Care shared that their benchmark trend rates were consistent with the GMCB approved rate filing. And for the self-funded, the submitted budget explains that um, One Care is analyzing the cost trends in more depth over the next few months and insights after this process can be shared as needed. And this table shows the expected cost of care um, for FY23 um, as and the, the benchmark um, for 2024, as well as the budgeted trend from base experience for the payer programs. Onward to target two. One care, uh, so it, uh, let's see, the ACO must use best efforts to meet or exceed the goals for reconciled and unreconciled FPP and identify and report specific obstacles to achieving the goals. So the goals for Medicaid were 55% FPP and commercial 24% FPP. These were goals that the board had set for one care. Um, was the target met? Yes, um, for FY23 and anticipated for 24 Medicaid is a, a approximately uh, is is over that target it's over 55 percent for commercial it is zero just to be clear this target is not that they meet the uh the goal it's that they use their best efforts to do so and report specific obstacles to achieving these goals so even though they did not meet the target with commercial they did um, report their best efforts and obstacles they described that they continue to negotiate with commercial payers to implement unreconciled fixed payment models obviously this is a two-sided negotiation and both parties must agree on the terms the slide shows the expected cost of care in the columns from 2018 through 2024 and each column is broken into uh, fee for service and then FPP and CPR payments. Um, the blue represents the portion of the expected total cost of care that's fee for service, and the green is that uh, FPP CPR payment. And then the line is the percentage of the expected total cost of care that is in FPP. So you can see that it has varied quite a bit over the years. Um, but for 2024, it looks like overall, 44.2% of all of the payments in expected total cost of care would be uh, FPP CPR payments. And then this shows the targets and, and 
where One Care has been um, over the years from 2018 through 2024. So if we start down at the bottom with the gray line, we see the commercial um, has been almost zero the whole time. Um, there was a few years where there was a small amount of fixed perspective payments offered by uh, a commercial program, but we're back down to zero uh, percent for 2024. Um, and then the dotted green line is represents that um, goal of 24%. The blue line is the Medicare amount of a fixed perspective payment. There is no goal surrounding that. Um, the green dotted line is the 55% goal for Medicaid. And you can see that um, that the solid green line uh, has been above that the whole time. So um, the FPP target for Medicaid has, has been successfully met. All right, so targets three and four. Number three was the ACO must hold 100% of the Medicare advanced shared savings dollars at risk at the entity level and not pass the risk along to the provider networks. Um, this target is a continuation of a multi-year effort to have OneCare hold these dollars at risk last year um, as a glide path to this, this target. Um, the board had OneCare hold approximately between 30 and 40 percent of these dollars at the entity level um, with the intention that this year um, they would hold 100 percent. One care chose not to do this. They are holding approximately 8.8 percent of those dollars at risk at the entity level and the rest of those dollars um, are distributed as risk throughout the network. The fourth target was to increase risk corridors for all payer programs above FY23 levels, um, and the target was not met in this uh, in this budget submission. And the risk corridors remain static between 23 and 24. So regarding 20 uh, target number three, this slide shows budgeted risk from 2019 through 2024 and the percent of risk held at the entity level versus the risk delegated to the provider network. It's nice to look back um, pre-pandemic to see what these risk levels were um, and how they were significantly lowered during the pandemic. So for FY24, you can see that the total risk level is back up to pre-pandemic levels, um, but the OCV held portion of the risk is, is quite a bit lower still. Um, for context, one care typically is taken on risk as a glide path to support HSAs who are newly joining payer programs. This was back in their earlier years um, when those HSAs were not ready to take on the full risk level in their first year in the program. And you can see in FY23 that One Care's risk increased after they held a portion of those Medicare advanced shared savings dollars. But in 2024, instead of holding more risk, they reverted back down to lower levels. This is for budget target four. These are risk corridors over time in the public payer programs. So you can see in um, the Medicare pre-pandemic, it was up at 5%. And then during the pandemic years, it was knocked down to 2%. And then the last two years, it's back to 3%. Um, and Medicaid, similarly, at one point, we'd gotten up to 4%, but we're back down. Um, then it got knocked down to 2% uh, and 1% for the expanded cohort. And now we've been at, at 3 um, for a couple of years now. So we had... Um, we had, like I said, um, asked One Care to expand those for 2024. Target number five, the ratio of operating expenses to PHM or payment reform payments, which include FPP and budgeted bonus payments, must not exceed the five-year average of 3.25. Um, is the target met? Yes, um, there, that ratio is at 3.1%. Um, I know it shows the five-year average is off by a couple of hundredths of a percent um, here, but you can see over time what that ratio has been um, and, and where uh, we are for FY24, higher than the years before, but definitely lower than um, 2018, 2019. 
Target six and seven, um, the board had considered adding targets for these areas, but the requested information from One Care to inform these targets was not provided. So the board decided rather than set a target without the information that they would let uh, be left as placeholders. Target number eight, uh, the ratio of population health management funding to the number of attributed lives must be at a minimum of the FY23 revised budget amount. <clears throat> Specific line items may vary upon any internal evaluation of the effectiveness of the individual PHM programs. The ACO, and then there's a second part to this, um, the ACO must propose a plan to increase the accountability of its provider network for quality. Examples for increased accountability could include adding in an adjustment to the hospital fixed payments for quality or increasing the ratio of the PHM bonus payments to base payments for primary care and community providers. Um, was this target met? Yes, it was. Um, the population health management funding per attributed life is at $166 per life. And uh, the staff found that the accountability uh, for the providers was increased through increasing the ratio of the PHM bonus payments to base payments and the addition of network provider accountabilities to the provider contracts. So I just do want to note that <clears throat> The population health spending line does include the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings Dollars. Um, there are different ways of looking at, at population health support. So just to be clear that those dollars are included in this ratio. Um, let's see. So you can see that uh, there have uh, it outlines the changes in the number of attributed lives over the course of the ACO's operations, the amount of population health spending and the operating expenses in each one of those years, and then calculating how many dollars per attributed life were spent on both population health spending and operational expenses. And for the sake of this budget target, we are looking at um, that middle row and the fine and the column on the right, that $166 is, is higher than um, the projected 2023, which is um, 134. So they met this budget target. Um, the second half of that target was around increasing accountabilities. So this reviews the um, network accountabilities that One Care introduced to their uh, network this year. All of the participating <clears throat> providers need to, uh, when they sign their contract, they're also agreeing to meet these accountabilities. So these accountabilities include six different areas, the first one being technology. Um, participants are expected to implement and utilize an electric, electronic health record that's compatible with CMD 2015 cert certification uh, standards on or before January 1st, 2025. Um, about 10 um, TINs that have historically participated in One Care do not or, or may not meet the CERT requirements. Um, when we asked One Care about this, they had established that about four do not have EHRs at all, um, and that six they hadn't received a response back from. Um, they are not providing any financial support for these practices to upgrade uh, their technology. The second one is care model. Uh, uh, maintain alignment with One Care's care model and actively pursue attaining 75th percentile or more in 50% or more of PHM quality metrics in 2024 and 85th percentile in 75th and 75% or more in 2025. The third one, health equity, incorporates social determinants of health screening into yearly patient visits. Beginning July 1st, 2024, electronically report those SDOH screening rates to One Care and develop a plan to collaborate to systemically address gaps in care by July 1st, 2024. The fourth one, engagement, participate in 50% or more of One Care's value-based care uh, related meetings annually. Citizenship, commit to One Care's organizational values, which include collaboration, excellence, innovation, equity, and communication. And finally, cost and quality performance, perform at or above the One Care target performance level on follow-up after emergency department uh, visits for individuals with high risk, uh, multiple chronic conditions.
I think I may have skipped. All right, I may be missing a slide. I apologize. <clears throat> so would you not. would you mind go back? Would you mind going back to twenty five and walking us through the bottom of that slide? Sure, absolutely. So this um, the the bottom of this slide is the operating expenses per attributed life. You can see at the beginning as um, attribution was much lower. Um, it's to be expected that getting something up and running that the you know your operating expenses are going to be higher before you have um, you know all of your attributed lives on board. It went down during um, you know, 2020, uh, 2021, 2022, as attribution was increasing. Um, and then with the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield payer program, you can see quite a drop in attribution between 2022 and 2023. It really changed that ratio. Um, so we went from $61 per attributed life up to 75 per attributed life. Um, and then in 2024, again, we see another drop in attribution, and that is due to the Medicaid redeterminations. Um, so that that is why that, uh, in addition to increased operating expenses, why that that dollar amount is higher down in that bottom right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And it does seem that I am um, I'm missing a slide, but I had I had mentioned that um, another way that one care increased their provider accountability was to change the ratio of their PHM payments to uh, increase the bonus payment that the um, provider can earn by um, performing higher in their PHM measures. So overall, the payments to the potential payments to providers increased from 23 to 24, but the base payment actually decreased. Um, so just practicing status quo, just reporting on care coordination, providers would actually earn less in 2024. But if they really work hard to shake things up and improve outcomes, they are eligible for a higher payment than they, than they earned last year. Okay, target nine. This is the last target. Um, this is regarding the March 2023 Medicare benchmarking report. We asked that one where one care ranks below the 10th percentile among national ACO cohort or metrics where the trend has shown a decrease in performance between the years of 2019 and 2021, choose three metrics that the ACO will address through the quality evaluation and improvement plan. The ACO should use metrics on which the ACO's provider network has the most influence on the outcomes and should justify their choice of said metrics. This target has been met. They chose three targets, ED utilization, annual wellness visits, and the number of beneficiaries with a primary care visit. And just to be clear, these are for Medicare beneficiaries. Here are just some snippets of OneCare's performance in these three different areas. OneCare is the uh, dotted line there. For ED visits, you can see that they are, it looks like they're above, but they're you want it lower, right, in this particular instance. So um, they are doing, they are not even at the 10th percentile. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, the percent of members with an annual wellness visit, it, they are pretty close to the 10th percentile. Um, again, a lot of room for improvement. And then percent of members with a primary care visit, uh, one care is coming in below the 10th percentile. So they are incentivizing their network to improve these metrics um, through a few different ways. They are using the PHM measures um, so that Providers, in order to get that bonus payment, they have to perform well on these measures. So uh, potentially avoidable ED visits um, and wellness visits for folks who are 40 years and older. Um, and then also we saw with the network accountabilities, there was one around their performance on ED utilization among folks with chronic um, conditions. They also, they're a performance incentive pool, which is another way for HSAs to be rewarded for high performance. Um, the, the, those dollars are doled out to HSAs that uh, have lower ED utilization. 
Okay, so those are the targets. What was met, what wasn't met. Now we're gonna look at some of their finances and their performance. So this, um, this is a very high level overview. I just wanted to review that we can look at the budget in two different ways. The full accountability or total cost of care budget is in the purple. Um, and then the entity level or organizational level budget is in orange. So the full accountability budget su uh, submitted is the result of provider network participation, negotiated payer program terms, and one care strategies to develop their network payer programs. It includes healthcare spending for one care attributed lives for total cost of care services uh, that are processed externally to one care. So that's 96%. So it's all the dollars flowing through one care to provide care. It also includes um, a small amount of population health expenses, just 2.5%. And then um, administrative expenses at 1.5%. So the full accountability budget is reviewed and approved by the One Care Board of Managers, but One Care cannot unilaterally decide the contract terms with payers, such as payment models, benchmark trend rates, and risk arrangements. The entity level submitted is developed at the discretion of the One Care governance and leadership, meaning that it uh, is elements of the budget that are not contractually obligated and are developed through committees made up of, provi of the provider network supported by One Care staff and leadership and approved by their board of managers. Uh, revenues that are not contractually obligated with payers include participation fees from the hospitals, fixed payment allocations, which also come from the hospitals, and shared savings distribution, which is set in policy by OneCare. Expenses include the PHM investments, administrative expenses, and shared losses, if there are any. If you, uh, you won't see shared savings and losses in their budget because One Care budgets uh, as break even, meaning that they budget to hit their targets exactly, including the advanced shared savings uh, dollars that fund the blueprint. All right, here is a view of their summary income statement. There is a lot here. Um, so I wanna point out what years we're looking at with this view. Um, we have 2018 actuals, we have 2023 projected, and we have the 2024 budget. To the right of that, we have the delta between 2023 and 2024, and then we also have the delta between 2018 and 2024, so we can really see long term how specific line items have changed. All right, so, oops, I apologize. Okay, so I would ask the board to look at um, the subtotal of operating expenses, which is about two thirds of the way down. In 2018, you can see that it was at 13.7 uh, million dollars, and then for 2024, um, it's up at uh, 14.29 uh, um, million dollars, which is an increase of about four percent over time. Um, and then let's look at specifically what what makes up that operated those operating expenses. So for salaries and benefits, um, we have it in 2018 it was at 7.3 million, and then for 2024 we're up to 8.1 million. That is an 11.5 percent increase over time. Regarding contracted and purchase services. That line item has jumped a lot. It's jumped from um, 1.7 million up to over 4 million, which is an increase of 147.7 million. Some of that story can be told if you look at the software line. The software line has decreased considerably over time, and that's due to the transition to Arcadia, where they are now contracting with UVM Health Network to provide those services for them. So just overall wanted to point out that um, how, how those specific line items have changed over time. Um, and then this slide just shows that there that the state has invested some money over over time, especially in the earlier years um, to get the ACO off the ground. Um, they had 
uh, one care had told us that, you know, in 2022, the loss of this funding was significant for them. Sometimes these monies also involved a federal match. So they were receiving quite a bit of support earlier on in their program um, from both the state and, and federal governments. Okay, so we're gonna uh, pivot to performance review. So how do we measure success of one care? Um, and what data do we have to measure success? Um, there are four different data points that we look at. We look at the quality and financial results, um, those annual payer contract scorecards, we heard about 22 performance last week. We look at the Medicare uh, benchmarking report that OneCare is now submitting to the board twice a year. We look at OneCare's performance of their own PHM me measures, as well as their performance on their key performance indicators. So, and I just want to say that even for the highest performing ACO, we would expect to see mixed results, uh, areas of high and low performance, but these measures uh, will help guide our focus as regulators um, and should similarly focus uh, one care as well. So this is, um, we're looking at payer program results, their quality results um, from 2018 through 2022. Like I said, 2022 were presented, uh, the results were presented to the board last Wednesday, November 29th. Um, so we have five, five data points now. Um, comparability can be a, a challenge given several factors, difference in Medicare program quality framework in 2018 was much different than what it is now. Um, the introduction of Medicaid expanded attribution, the public health emergency, um, you also should consider scale growth in each payer program over time and potential impacts on results. But the numbers, I think, speak for themselves. At face value, it seems pretty simple, but there's definitely it's a nuanced it's a nuanced thing. The next is the financial results. This slide might be a little confusing. The numbers in parentheses are savings. They're in parentheses because they are under the target. So in this case, the numbers in parentheses denote shared savings. So we have 2018 through 2023 um, projected, and <clears throat> we and then over on the right, I, we have the same table, but we took out 2020 because that was um, a, a very unique year um, with the public health emergency, and and um, people weren't able to access the care that they that they usually would. So you can see that Medicare um, is a clear winner in the story. Um, year over year, Vermont comes in under the Medicare target, um, which seems great, right? So uh, there's a couple of points that I just want to make. Um, this can't be there. Are multi there are multiple factors that should be considered as to we come in under the Medicare benchmark. Part of it could be one care, but there are other factors. Um, there are factors like the blueprint, the target itself is a negotiated number. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you're able to negotiate a favorable number, that makes it easier. Uh, the other thing I think about when I look at the savings in Medicare is, is the fact that the risk corridors are so small that we're really leaving a lot of money on the table. If those risk corridors had been larger over time, we would have been able to, um, to take home a lot, a lot more of those savings. We can also think about the sources of participation fees that the hospitals pay into OneCare which is really the primary source of how OneCare keeps its doors open is through these hospital participation fees. We hear from hospitals that they are not able to break even with Medicare and Medicaid payments. So it's really the commercial payments that are keeping these hospitals going and must be ultimately paying these participation fees. So when there are Medicare savings, only a portion of that savings is actually paid out to the ACO network because of the risk arrangement, as I said. So Medicare gets to keep the rest of those savings. Um, and if the ACO is saving Medicare money, 
but at the expense of commercial funds and the Vermonters who pay for those commercial, um, you know, very high premiums and deductibles. It's just something to consider about the system. Um, about is you know it i think it's possible to frame it as commercial payers um and vermonters who are paying for those um as kind of subsidizing this program and and success um the success we're seeing in the medicare program as well the other thing i want to look at was the Met benchmarking report <clears throat> This is a subset of measures that we look at um, that we have been advised that um, ACOs have particular control over. They include ambulatory care sensitive admissions. It includes total cost of care, emergency room visits and um, primary care utilization. So this shows uh, performance of one care between 2019 and 2022. There's a handful of these that are inverse. I'll just throw that out there. Um, and I think the it's not a full picture because we don't have a national cohort on the slide to compare trends with. So it could be a national trend and um, not necessarily just a one care in a vacuum performance. But this, I wanted to show this for general, you can see the trend lines on the right and generally see kind of a mixed, um, a, a mixed bag um, of, of outcomes. And you can see, um, especially primary care here as kind of appears down at the bottom. And those those have just been declining um, since 2019. So as far as the PHM measure and KPI performance, um, there's a lot of overlap with these metrics for one care. So I, I put them all on the same slide. Um, so I have the measures, I have the 2023 target that they have set for their network. Um, they provided the progress of their network through March 2023, so just really Q1 performance on these metrics, and whether their target, their self-imposed target, has been met by their network um, during Q1. So for child and adolescent well care visits, uh, the target is 57.5, and right now network wide, or I should say back then, um, earlier in the year, they were at 57.2, but 40% of their practices were meeting that target. Developmental screening, the target is 57.4%. Um, network wide, they're at 60.4%, um, and 40% of practices were meeting that target, so that target was being met at that time. For diabetes A1C poor control, the target is 39.9%. Um, when they submitted, 97% of practices were meeting this target, and they said it was to be determined, but things look bright to the point that um, OneCare is removing this metric from their 2024 um, PHM measures because they feel as though the network has made a lot of progress in this area, and they've kind of topped out with their performance. Regarding initial hypertension, this is um, an HSA specific metric. So it is, um, there's no set number. They're expecting an HSA to look at their score and then improve by 10%. So if your HSA was at 40%, let's say, it's expected that you would go to 44%. Um, in the first quarter, one of 14 HSAs um, were meeting that target. For routine hypertension, again, a 10% improvement. Um, first quarter, five of the 14 HSAs were meeting that target. Annual wellness visits, 40 plus. Um, in the first quarter, 19% of practices were meeting the target, but at the HSA level, none of them were meeting that target yet. And then the final one is not a PHM measure, it is just a KPI, which is a potentially avoidable ED visits. And um, they were looking again for 10% improvement by HSA uh, and 33% were, were making that <clears throat> improvement so far. All right. I wanted to also touch on one care support for primary care, as this is a consideration in statute that the board must examine as part of reviewing their budget of an ACO. Overall, the funding through population health efforts per attributed life has increased since 2022. Because 
this in, so you can see that here in this middle row um, that it, per life, it has increased per life. I'm sorry, the ratio has increased um, over time. So in 2022, for every attributed life, there was $71 of population health. Um, and I just want to note what this number includes and doesn't include, because as I mentioned, population health payments uh, can be looked at in a few different ways. But in this analysis, it doesn't include FPP or fee for service. Um, so I just wanted to note that. Um, <clears throat> so it's the um, ratios have increased over time, but these dollars are linked to attribution. So between 2022 and 2024, we've seen quite a drop in attribution. So the total amount going to primary care has dropped from 16.1 million down to 12.7 million. And I think it's easy to say that, you know, it's it more per life is going. And when these dollars are linked to attribution, it's like, they're doing all they can to um, to support these primary care um, physicians or programs, <clears throat> given the number of attributed lives they have. I think the one point I'll make is that these practices are um, still seeing the same patients. It's just fewer of them are attributed to one care. So they are still providing the same care for patients. They're just not receiving as many support payments to care for these patients and to innovate um, and, and to hire additional staff. Um, so it's, uh, I think this shows that tying these dollars to attribution is has is challenging um, <clears throat> for the for the practices as attribution has has shrunk. Okay, so these are the options for budget modification and approval. I will read through each one um, and then we'll move on, but we'll, we can always come back to this slide. Um, so the first one is to fund one cares budget as submitted with any or all reporting conditions as outlined in the following slides, which we will review. Number two is the same as number one, plus a new condition that one care must hold the Medicare advanced shared savings dollars as risk at the entity level unless they increase the Medicare risk corridor for FY24. Third option, reduce one care salary and purchase services from 12.5 million to the 2018 level of 7.4 million and evenly reallocate these funds to non-hospital owned independent primary uh, practices uh, to improve primary care, including the additional conditions regarding reporting with or without that risk option. Fourth uh, option, one care, reduce one care's administrative expenses from 14.3 million to the 2018 level of 13.7 million and evenly reallocate these funds to non-hospital owned independent primary care practices to improve primary care, including additional conditions regarding reporting with or without risk options. Number five, reduce one care's administrative expenses from 14.3 million to 11.6 million in order to maintain the ratio of administrative expenses to attributed lives at the 2023 level of $75 per life. You could also add the additional conditions, uh, the reporting conditions with or without the risk uh, option as well for that one. And the final one is the, one of the HCA's recommendations. Reduce one cares purchase services line by 50%, which is currently at 4.3 million, and evenly reallocate these funds to hospital owned independent primary care practices to improve primary care. Um, and then you could add additional conditions regarding reporting with or without the risk option I described in number two. That's a lot to think about. I will come back to the slide. I wanna walk you through the reporting conditions uh, to consider. So these conditions are consistent with previous years. Um, One Care would notify the board of any material changes to their budget and explain any variance. 
submit a, a revised budget by March 31st, 2024, and present on the revised budget in April 2024, including final payer contracts, attribution by payer, a revised budget, hospital dues and risk, and changes to the risk model, source of funds of population health programs. Third, notify the board of any use of reserves or line of credit or any adjustment to participation fees. Um, implement benchmark trend rates for payer contracts in alignment with the board's decision on the Medicare ACO benchmark. Our presentation on that is next week and the vote the following week. The uh, GMCB's Medicaid advisory rate case and for commercial contracts in alignment with the ACO attributed population and the Green Mountain Care Board's approved rate filings. Um, fourth, uh, the last one here, engage in payer programs that qualify for APM scale to the greatest extent possible and align payer programs in key areas to the extent reasonable, explain non-scale qualifying programs and areas of misalignment, require uh, continued reporting on payer programs. These are also consistent um, with previous years, fund population health management, pro, uh, management and payment reform programs as detailed in the FY24 submission, or we may end up um, modifying possibly, and notify GMCB of any changes, including funding shortfalls, changes in program scope, or an, and an analysis for each program line item as to whether and why the funding is appropriately scaled for by attribution or some other factor. Report evaluation results and evaluation focus areas for 2024 to the board. Fund the support and services at home or SASH program and the blueprint for health payments to primary care practices and community health teams consistent with the amount approved by the Green Mountain Care Board in the Medicare ACO benchmark process, which will be presented next week. These deliverables are pretty consistent, but I would like to perhaps um, update some of the uh, the, con the conditions are consistent. I would like to update some of the deliverables. Um, work with the Medicare Advantage plans working in Vermont with a particular focus on Vermont-based programs um, offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, the UVMMC MVP program to develop scale qualifying programs. Report FPP data and progress towards the goals as specified in the ACA reporting manual and 24 guidance report on their CPR program and make it some improvements to the benchmarking report, including um, a statistical significance analysis and a risk uh, report on risk of all cohorts for each year. And then I included the new one that I mentioned in option number two, one care to hold all uh, hold risk for all Medicare advanced shared savings dollars unless the Medicare risk corridor uh, is increased above 3%. Just a quick timeline seeing, you know, there's a lot to think about, but we have two weeks before the potential vote um, and uh, the potential for to deliberate next Wednesday. That is all I have at this point. I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster, for any board discussion. Great. Thank you, Ms. Sawyer. Um, and just to be clear of the options that are presented in the potential conditions, the board can, of course, consider others as well. That's just a set for us to start thinking about in advance of the deliberations. Absolutely. Um, I'll open up to any board member questions or comments. Michelle, I had a question on something that you said related to the financial analysis. I thought I heard you say, and I either you misspoke or I misheard, that Medicare benchmark was negotiated, which is not the case. The board sets the trend for the Medicare benchmark based on data that is provided by Lewin, which is Medicare's contractor. So I, I just wanted to circle back to that because I did, I don't know if I heard you wrong, but that would be incorrect if that's what you said. What you just said is my understanding as well. I apologize if I misspoke. That's okay. Um, I thought it was in relationship to whether or not the benchmark was on, was like a reasonable target. So since we that's said it- That's just for the commercial. The commercial okay. ones are negotiated, right. right? Right, that's true. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and there was some indication in the MVP discussion last week about their benchmark, not the risk adjustment in their benchmark, not adequately adjusting for actual risk. So that makes sense to me. Thank you for that clarification. Um, 
I do have questions um, on the, could we go back to the recommendations? I guess I'll start there. So uh, why are we picking 2018 in these specific numbers in three through five? That is a good question, Robin. Um, this is what I um, heard as as interest. Um, it, these specific options. Um, so I tried my best to deliver a series of options that fell in line with what I I had heard was of interest to the board. Okay, so maybe before we negotiate the board members who had interest could articulate the why these years and why these numbers so that I can understand uh, where it's coming from. I mean, obviously not, people can choose to do that today or not, but uh, that's, it's, I'm not seeing like the connections here. Um, my, and I'll just tell you my other question. So why, uh, independent PCPs, which are 18 practices, as opposed to putting more money into other population health programs, which understandably would make it more diffuse, but would potentially have more impact on moving, uh, if this is connected, for example, to a quality, a particular quality metric or something like that. Um, I'm not sure if 18 practices have enough attribution to move the ACO wide performance measures. So I, I just have a question about that in terms of like, I, I need somebody to connect the dots for me. Sure, I, I, can, I can say a couple of things. Um, so there are 18 practices that um, are enrolled in the CPR program, but there are more, um, I believe there's, 24 approximately independent primary care practices that are part of the one care network and just not all of them participate in the CPR. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, the other is I believe, you know, this this was noted this way because of the quality um, of independent primary care and their ability to to see patients. Um, but I think that this is it would be a good place to discuss. Um, and and I don't think it's a hard and fast thing. It's just a starting point okay. for yep. for discussion. Yep. Um, do we have could we get the evidence on the independent the quality for these independent practices, these twenty four, so that we know that it matches whatever evidence you're referring to? So that's a question. Okay. Um, also,, uh, you had indicated in on slide 38 that attribution is down, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean the primary care practice are seeing fewer patients. Do we have data on that? For example, we did hear in a public comment about a practice that had uh, reduced their number of patients uh, rather recently because of some staffing issues that they had. So how do we know that the practices are seeing the same number of patients? I can certainly see if I can find that data um, and provide that, Robin. Okay. I mean, it's not a, that big a deal. I just wasn't sure where that statement was coming from, sure. given that we had had that uh, public comment previously. Um, on the on the attribution generally. Um, do we have any information on the current status of the Medicaid redetermination and how that's going? I would, to your point earlier, a big decrease in the in the attributed lives is related to the Medicaid redeterminations. The stats that I had seen early on from the DEVA website indicated a lot of that was paperwork, which is not unexpected. That's typically why people fall off during redeterminations. Um, 
So I was just curious how that was going, if we have any information on whether or not they would expect some rebound. So for example, since Medicaid will pay retro 90 days, if somebody shows up at a hospital and the hospital's able to get them signed up again uh, so they can get paid for that day, that will help with bringing people back onto Medicaid. So just getting any sense of that might be a little helpful if we're going to be looking at um, her life targets. Sure, we can reach out to Diva um, between that and, and the attribution reporting that we receive from OneCare on a quarterly basis. I can try to get a clear picture of what is happening currently. Thank you. That would just, that background would be helpful. Um, and then on the Medicare shared savings at risk at the entity level, um, why the connection to increasing the risk order? I'm from sorry. my Can mind, you... let, let me just give you, so in my mind, the reason why we had suggested, at least my reason for why I had voted for the Medicare shared saving dollars being at risk at OneCare was because of solving the issue that we've heard from hospitals that they were perceiving the advanced shared savings as asymmetric risk. So that then I don't, I can't follow that through to increasing the risk corridor and how that would solve that problem, which is what I thought, at least for me, was the problem I was trying to solve with that. Now, I will say, you know, I am of two minds on the risk at the one care level. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, obviously, about where we will be moving forward in the future. And if, and this is a big if, the state were to pursue and sign an agreement in the AHEAD model, the risk in that model is on the hospitals. So there's an argument that, in, and obviously we don't know if we're gonna do that or not. So this is this argument can go either way, but that if you wanted to prepare folks or you wanted people to be more prepared for holding risk, you would actually shift it onto the hospitals now. So they get some experience of that over the next two years, should we move forward with that? Obviously there's a lot of ifs there. Um, so that's, that's just some initial thoughts on how I'm thinking about that and would love some discussion around that. Um, I'm going to be quiet now and look at my notes and see if I had anything else and give other folks a chance to speak. I could I could hop in for a couple questions. Um, can can I just follow up with just a question uh, coming from Robin's question? Could you provide an argument, Michelle, for we sort of had the argument for why having more risk at the hospital level may have some advantages for potential future um, risk management? Could you provide an argument for why having one terrible uh, risk? Uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Dr. Merman. Oh, same. Let let me uh, let me pass and then come up with a different solution. Okay. Michelle, can I add just a quick question? Um, and this is actually a little bit following on some of the, if some of these recommendations are looking at a per life level, per attributed life level. I just one other uh, question I had, and maybe this, I have to go back to our, our slides originally. I'm trying to, um, it'd be helpful to unpack how much of the decline in attributed lives is also related to Medicare Advantage uptake. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if we have those numbers as well. I know most of it is Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, the redeterminations, but if if there is that data, that would be helpful to know. Um, and I'm just, um, you know, I, I guess I would say that I'm looking at these now and um, it would be really helpful. I think we're, this is on the agenda for next week um, is to revisit um, have some deliberations and revisit, and it'd be really helpful for me to see pros and cons associated with with these uh, each of these options. And 
you know, some assessment of intended and potentially unintended consequences of, of some of these. And so if we can just uh, have a little bit more context for um, the justifications, what we're hoping to achieve and and some of the you know downside risk of some of these uh, proposed modifications would be helpful to me. And I'm going to obviously think about these for the next week. I may have some other ideas and I'll, I'll bring them up next week if I have them. So but I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Could I give another try? Sure. OK, how's that? Are we we have audio? It's better. Okay, thanks. It's much better. All right. Sorry about that. Um, I have a my, my old computer died. I have a new computer and this is the, the maiden voyage here and uh, seems like I got some kinks to work out. Um, so my question for you was that um, Robin talked about the potential advantages of having risk health at the hospital level, and I was wondering if you could just refresh me on the sort of the logic behind having that risk held at the ACO level and, and what the board was trying to accomplish by doing that last year and, and potentially in the future. Sure. Um, as Robin said, a lot of the we were hearing from hospitals that including those advanced shared savings dollars as downside risk, it really made the Medicare um, risk quarter appear to be asymmetrical. So the hospitals had to earn back those dollars before they could even really start looking at savings. There was more at loss than there really was, you know, it, it set them behind in, in, in saving money. Um, and I would say nationwide, it's pretty common to see ACOs at the entity level hold at least some risk. Um, and so we thought that transitioning um, those dollars to the entity would both solve the asymmetrical um, risk corridor problem that we were hearing existed, and it would give OneCare um, some accountability as well. Okay. So more your recollection of or opinion on this would be more that it was for trying to alleviate that perceived risk by the hospitals with the with this um, advanced shared savings money more than sort of the concept of like a skin in the game where where the the as an incentive to try to uh, to one care to try to figure out how to save you know, have more shared savings. There was, I think there were, both of them played a factor, but I would say the, the former was the larger concern. Okay. Um, and I, I do want to thank you, by the way, just up front for like the tireless work that you've put into preparing and learning and pre presenting and and um, and, and I, I really appreciate the hard work of the team and, and of you specifically. So um, I just had a few other questions. I think some of this will take a little bit of time to digest of what you presented, but um, have we received any one information from OneCare about the request for trying to figure out the administrative cost by program? So what the various mm -hmm. programs cost? No, we had asked um, in the budget guidance for OneCare to provide that information their budget broken out by program, um, but they said that is not that's not how they do their their budgets. So they were unable to be responsive to that request. Okay. And then and then have you received? I, I hadn't seen, but have you received any information or had any uh, other communications from One Care regarding the variable compensation specific and measurable goals that are in the care board's rule for the next year, or it, or if if we know how those are going to shake out for this budget? Um, no, I, I, from my recollection, the uh, corporate goals to which their variable executive compensation will be tied um, will either be determined by their board of managers later this month or potentially in January after the vote. OK. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Um, thank you so much. Hey, Michelle, it's Tom. I just want to also share my um, thanks for all the work that's um, 
tremendously big lift. Um, and, and I just have a, a couple questions. Um, one, um, and I, I'm not sure they can be answered today, so I'm not expecting, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot or um, require anything, but could we go to slide 25, please? So I'd like some help understanding how the numbers shown here compare to the HCA public comment. In the public comment, um, they had um, in their appendices, there were figures that showed declining public health payments over time and increasing, I think they said, payroll and consulting expenses which I think would be in rolled into operating expenses. Um, these numbers seem, um, I'm having a hard time squaring these numbers. These numbers look like um, things are moving in a, in a better direction for the, from a one care perspective. Um, and the HCA public comment, um, didn't look as favorable for one care. And so I, I need some help maybe from you and staff and from the HCA to try to square these, um, it, at least in my mind, because I'm I'm a little bit confused. And um, we can do it now, we can do it during the week, we can do it next week um, during deliberations. But um, I found, I just had some trouble lining these things up. Um, if there's an easy answer, I'd love to hear it now, but if we need to wait, can do that. I can I can offer a brief a brief explanation in that I believe what the HCA is considering population health spending is different from what we had traditionally uh, pre uh, presented. This table we've shown in, in previous presentations, and we felt it was important to keep it consistent. Um, so in this particular slide, those dollars include the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings dollars. So that could be the difference between the, what the HCA is showing and what we're showing with this slide, but um, that's just off the top of my head, the first thing okay. that I would flag. But we can, I think, have a good conversation about this and with the HCA. Great. I see Dr. Schulteis is here too. So happy to um, hear from him now or or at, at any time, but just trying to help me um, square these, that, that would be great. Um, do, do you want I, me I, to answer, Tom? Like, I, I have some rough things. I mean, I'm just thinking about other things that may be going on. I think Michelle is right um, about the methodology. If you look at a, well, I tried, perhaps unsuccessfully, in that there's a power graph in that section where I go over how it's done. Looking at this, I think because of confidentiality concerns, we went with the budgeted numbers each year. Um, we also excluded 18 um, because we felt it was, uh, well, I felt it was unfair because of startup costs. So, I mean, that's kind of like a judgment call, right? Like mm -hmm. whether we include 17 and 18 or just 18 or neither. Um, yeah. And then I'm looking at this and I think part of the reason and it, you know, it, in terms of how their admin costs look, it looked better, but PHM didn't look bad, makes it look worse, is we put it in real dollars. And I think that's a general preference that I have for comparing financial numbers over time. So that's gonna inflate the 219, uh, 2019 spend uh, relative to the 2014 spend. Um, you know, and, and then of course, as Michelle pointed out, it's what we're counting as PHM spend. So whether we're counting the blueprint, whether we're counting um, FPP, you know, I think um, I tried to do it similar to the PHM spend in the NORC report, um, which I wasn't able to perfectly replicate. Um, it was a little unclear what data sources they were using. And then, um, 
you know, I also, with the caveat that I also excluded uh, blueprints, Ben. So I guess all in all, I think it's just there, it's just different looks. I don't think, I wouldn't expect numbers to line up exactly because we're using relatively substantial different methods. Okay. Um, so just a um, couple follow-ups, if I could. When you say real dollars, you're, does should I take that to mean inflation adjusted to current day? Uh, it's adjusted with um, CPIU nationally for 2023. It's using um, the average of the of the existing nine months of CPIU as a. Okay. Uh, I guess estimated, and then for 2024, it's using. Well, at the time that I did this, the new economists uh, approach the, the state economists had it released CPIU projection, so it was using uh, a CPIU assumption for 2024 based on. Uh, I think two years average. I, I spell it out in one of the footnotes. Okay. So definitely take a look at that. I have this bizarre love for footnotes. So it's <laughs> it's in there somewhere. I appreciate it. So there is basically trying to get it all to a to current um, dollar amount or best we can. And sure. the the rationale for leaving out um, the blueprint, um, I could imagine, correct me because I can also be wrong about these things, but um, leaving out the blueprint is to try to isolate the effect of one gear. I, I think that's true. I mean, I think a, a plausible argument could be made that, you know, you should include blueprint because of how the paths through structure works and the reason yeah. we have um, one care. I think from my perspective, I felt like it was um, important to try to isolate what one care is doing that's new and not just what the blueprint is already doing. I think you probably could make the argument that, but for one care, there would be no blueprint. Okay. But, yeah. you know, that was a choice. Yeah, I appreciate your transparency with, with all that. Um, yeah, I think it'd be, I, this has been really helpful, but I think it, um, they're not, they're not just small differences. Sometimes it, like the, the differences are directional. And so um, helping us all feel confident about how these things differ, um, I think would be good because they have implications for the options that were outlined. I think three, five, and six um, would all depend on our, whether we, how deeply we understand this and the HCA analysis. Um, okay, could there were hands that went up. I don't want to move on if other people want to participate. Tom, we'll take public comment at, at, at the end. Um, okay. I thought one of our staff, I thought uh, Matt Sutter. Matt, did you have something? I saw your hand go up. I did. I was just going to explain the difference in how we're calculating and things that Eric hit everything I was going to say. Okay. Well, that's um, good. We, we can provide a crosswalk kind of explaining the differences um, this the board next week. That'd be great, Matt. Thank you. Um, could we go to slide 36, please? And this one, I just, I, I wanted a little bit more time to look at. Um, because, um, Personally, I don't have any trouble with inverse measures. I, I just have to slow down and remind myself of what is the what is the trend we're looking for. Um, some some of these um, the ED cost of care, total inpatient cost, um, primary care. Um, They're concerning. A lot of the trends are concerning in this, and I just I will take some more time to um, to look at it. It's 
it's not substantially different in my mind to what was presented last week regarding the quality performance. Um, but this is a different way to look at it. Um, and it's their concern. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding it. Um, and finally, the next slide, please. Here, uh, so in One Care's presentation earlier in the fall, um, I don't remember who from One Care, but um, they had mentioned a desire to stop tracking um, the proportion of patients with poorly controlled diabetes. And I remember at the time that the rationale for that was that their performance had topped out. It'd been the same year over year, and it gave me the impression during the meeting that that must be, they must be doing really well. And it surprised me because in the prior look at um, the proportion of patients with an A1C level greater than nine, the numbers hadn't been good. And here, diabetes A1C poor control, 39.9%, correct me if I'm wrong, that means nearly 40% of patients with diabetes are poorly controlled. There's nowhere that that's a good performance. And 97% and of practices meeting it isn't good performance. So I don't know if I'm reading it right, um, but that jumped Tom, out at me. Yeah. I forgive me, and I'm going off of my memory right now, but the memory that I have from the prior presentation was those rates were in the 21, 22, and there was one year where it dropped to 11.4, but it was kind of mostly around the 20 to 23 percent. So I'm not I'm not sure if these are um, looking at that in a different way. It, it's probably Anyway, I just I'll stop there. But I, yeah. there were different numbers in that presentation that don't meet this, and so I wonder if we're just kind of if it's just being looked at differently. Sure, um, twenty percent is not a good number either. But um, I'd like to understand. This isn't financial question. This is more of a performance question. Um, but those numbers are concerning, um, and so I'd. I'd like to make sure that I understand that. Because if it's if it's 20, 30, 40%, um, that measure should not be sunsetted. These are the patients who, um, patients with poorly controlled diabetes with comorbid mood disorders, anxiety and depression, are the group that commonly have the most unplanned ED visits and inpatient admissions and then surgical admissions as first uh, one, <laughs> their big toe is removed and their uh, foot is removed and their lower leg is removed. So these are the patients that most, most ACOs are really trying to find the patients with rising risk in order to prevent those ED visits and admissions. So if the numbers are in the 20 to 40% range, they should not be sunsetted. Um, then the, um, two more things. Um, the ACO level risk <clears throat> that Dave and Robin were talking about, ACOs are commonly doing that. They're accepting oftentimes 100% of the risk. And the reason that we were talking last year about this ACO having some risk is that providers were telling us that they did not have the data in order to know what to do better in order to, to earn their shared savings, and that there were no programs from the ACO to help them address the care coordination communication needs in order to improve care. So the providers were saying, we're not getting value from the ACO that would allow us to take more risk. 
So by shifting some risk onto the ACO, we, we were trying to say, give them more analytics, give them more programming that would help them better manage their patients because that's what ACOs are supposed to do. Right, the ACO concept was providers should be sharing risk, not just payers, not just the Medicare, Medicaid programs, but providers should share risk also. In this particular case, there's, in my mind, justification for the ACO sharing some risk to improve its performance to help enable the providers to meet what they need to meet. And then with the modification options, um, these are not mutually exclusive, right? Like somebody could get all crazy and say, I want two, three, and four. Right. Okay. And we and some new combinations possible. Um, and I don't remember exactly why. Um, when the in last year's budget presentation, um, we are trying to determine what costs one care had that were fixed and what were variable. What costs should fluctuate depending on the volume of patients, attributable lives, and what you just need to run a shop. And I asked, when were you fully staffed to meet the fixed cost of running the shop? And the answer was 2018. That's all from me. Um, uh, I, I have a, just a couple little comments and things to think about off of what some of the other board members said. One off of what member Holmes said about sort of some of these options here and thinking about the pros and cons and other ways they can be uh, thought of. I think over the next two weeks, we should work on that and see um, if there are other options we want or other ways to to use the money and if there's any things that we need to add to it to make sure it works uh, effectively. So, you know, for example, with the population health money that went back to the hospitals, we don't have any real certainty or evidence at this point that it was used for those purposes. And so if we're going to use money in a different way in this budget, uh, prove it differently, we should think about how we need to make sure that money will be used effectively. Um, and also to member Holmes's point, um, or maybe as Robbins, uh, where we're putting it and why we should think about quite a bit. The other thing I would think about kind of at a large level is um, it's one cares burden to justify their budget. And it looks to me like over the 2018 to 2022 results that we have, the quality is rather inconsistent, flat, or even negative in some regards certainly not like a consistent trend line like we saw you know last week in the payer um, uh, presentations we had it didn't really look like it was defined or it could be really attributed to anything that one care was doing programmatically and so if the results are sort of flat um, how do we conceptualize that in light of their burden to justify their budget and then the savings um, I think that the point was well made that it could be based on targets, it could be based on performance, it could be based on noise in the data, it could be based on other healthcare reform efforts, could be based on demographics, any number of things. And so it looks to me like from the um, slides and the evidence that we received from OneCare that the savings, and I'll quote savings, is also somewhat inconsistent from year to year and payer to payer. And certainly as to the two buckets we're most interested in, I think for Vermont payers, um, Medicaid and commercial is not significant. And so thinking about those, how are we conceptualizing whether one care met its burden to um, justify its budget? Um, similarly with the administrative costs, I, I, I'm trying to think of what are we getting for these things? And this is a point I raised last year 
why are we putting what or why is one care putting um, certain amounts of dollars into some programs and other amounts into others? And is that the right mixture? I think at the time there wasn't really a, a, a clear answer on that. But if we don't have a data that I think the staff had asked for or Dr. Merman about the administrative cost by program, I struggle with saying, okay, well, the whole budget in the whole then is approved and they've met their burden, right? So if we don't know what programs are really working or having an impact to the positive for Vermont, I struggle with what the evidence is or justification is to satisfy the, the budget. Um, and I guess I would say that in all candor, I'm a little bit vexed by the One Care budgets. And I say that because there are some things in this year's budget that I, I liked quite a bit that I thought were better. I thought the shift in the amount of um, the base being a little bit lower and, and the bonus being higher was beneficial. Um, I thought some of the approach was a little bit improved uh, overall, um, but really it seems to me like the crux of the benefit of the One Care program are some of the structural things, the, the money from the feds for um, Blueprint and SASH. And that's really just by mere existence rather than a, a programmatic effort. And then some of the waivers that's beneficial and some of the pass through and redistribution of money to where we want it, I think is beneficial. Um, so I'm trying to think about what those cost. And because I think those are justified because those are good. And then the other is it's sort of unclear if they're beneficial and or whether or not the burden's been met on those. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I don't think I had any other. Oh, one other one question, Michelle, for you. Um, on the state support slide, could you go back to that real quick? I think is informatic support. Yeah, thank you. These funds, were they matched by the feds, did you say? I believe in some years they weren't. I would have, or they were. I would have to get back to you with the details. I don't feel confident in saying definitively that they were matched every year. Okay. And can you remind me why they dropped off in 22? That may have been when the match expired. Um, I don't want to say anything incorrect. It may be because the high tech funding dried up at the end of 2021. Okay, Robin's nodding. So the high tech program was a federal program to um, find fund advancements in health information technology, and that program sunsetted in at the end of 2021. And then these funds were not; these are not part of the admin or operating expenses of One Care. There are additional revenue in the budget that we see. They are yes, they would show up under the revenue, not as admin expenses, right? Because they're right. No, because okay. this is money coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had nothing else. Um, thank you very much to you and your team for this presentation today. It was a lot of work for sure. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments they may have. Morning. Um, also, thanks, Michelle, Russ, and Angela for all your hard work on this. And thanks for a great discussion this morning to all the board members. Uh, I think our comments, concerns, and recommendations were really well summarized. So thank you, Michelle. Um, I think our concerns about relative declines in One Care's PHM investments over time relative to some other expenses um, is a key concern to us. And to Member Walsh, thanks for your questions and thanks our, to Eric uh, for answering in real time about that. Um, I think in general, there are some pretty consistent trends between what the board staff presented and what we our analysis did. I think there can be some method, methodological differences, but I think it's reasonable to us to expect PHM to either at least at a minimum be consistent or increase over time. And that's not what we've seen, at least in our analysis, which you know leads us to question the level of value that the model provides to Vermonters. And I want to recognize that the board is in a tough position having played a role establishing one care but we believe that the next all-payer model agreement should present the board with an opportunity to really conduct its own analysis to kind of what you were getting at um 
Chair Foster around return on investment, I think the board needs to do an analysis for itself and really decide to decide about the future um, of one care and whether or not it, it makes sense to continue with the all payer model or to consider alternative funding mechanisms. So thank you. Okay, and I'll turn it to public comment via the raise the hand function. Uh, Ms. Wasserman, good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I just have one um, quick question um, for the staff. One of the earlier slides, I don't have the number, talked about uh, fixed perspective payment. Uh, if we could go to that slide, I'd be interested in um, understanding a little more uh, clearly why um, uh, Medicare is considered um, fixed uh, perspective payment when, in fact, um, fixed perspective payment is also known as a capitated payment. And my understanding is that um, those fixed perspective payments to Medic uh, for Medicare on behalf of Medicare for the hospitals is reconciled at year's end. Um, so my question is, why is that considered? Why are the Medicare payments considered fixed perspective payments? Great question. Um, sorry, if I, can I sure. try? Yeah. Sorry, can I try and jump in? Absolutely. So, um, let me let me just ask the question uh, that I I think would be helpful, which which is, is is that correct that the Medicare fixed perspective payment is reconciled? That is correct. And are the others? Medicaid is not, it is unreconciled. Um, and can can you explain the rationale for that and um, why we include it here? Well, the Medicare payments, even though they are reconciled at the end of the year to fee for service, they are still fixed prospective payments made to the providers. So that payment mechanism still falls under the um, the definition of what a fixed perspective payment would be. Um, Medicare has not expressed an interest in being involved in an unreconciled version of this, whereas um, negotiations with DIVA have resulted in um, the ability for um, the network to receive unreconciled fixed perspective payments, which allows providers to, you know, if they overspend, if they spend more than their, their fixed payment was, then they're on the hook for make somehow figuring out the difference. But if they um, spend less than the fixed perspective payments they receive, uh, for the Medicaid lives, then they get to um, keep the additional monies themselves. Sir, does that answer your question? Yeah, so just for like a simple example, if I am a physician and I have a Medicare patient, let's say 10 Medicare patients, through the course of the year, I get a capitated payment, and that reconciliation is at year's end? Correct. That's my understanding. It, and if my billings on a fee-for-service basis are greater than the capitated payment that I receive from Medicare, what happens? The You have to send that money back and you are, you are losing that money, is my understanding. Right, so my capitated payments are $100, my fee-for-service billings are 125. Right. You only get to keep I, what you spent for fee for service or your you, you. Yes, if you spend more than what you were allotted, then you have to. Now I'm getting confused, Owen. Um, you know what? You know what? I, I, I put you on the spot. Let me we can get back to this. I, I think we can just briefly address this when we have a little bit of time to make sure we check the regs and the rules and make sure we have it right. So, yeah, I want to um, speak we, to it correctly. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, any other public comment? Yeah, I'd like to uh, make a comment. I, my computer dropped out, so I didn't hear the discussion between uh, Chair Foster and Michelle over the last couple minutes. But I guess what I would like to see is that the um, Medicare line be d titled Advance Payments, because that's in, in essence what is occurring is that the hospitals get advanced Medicare payments that are reconciled to fee for service at year's end. And I think a more accurate description is advanced payments as opposed to fixed prospective payments. It takes the term fixed prospective payments and um, dilutes it, which I don't think is helpful uh, in this discussion. Um, and again, I apologize for not being able to hear what you, what Michelle and Chair Foster were discussing. But um, I think calling um, things what they are actually it, it helps clarify and reduces confusion. Because let me say, there's a tremendous amount of confusion in all of this, uh, all, this whole uh, endeavor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment at this time? Um, uh, Mr. Berman, um, and I've been asked in the a number of hearings to to remind folks if people are affiliated with any of the regulated entities. So I'll just introduce you, Mr. Berman, if you don't mind, as the um, CEO of OneCare. Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss the important work that we're all doing together with the public. Um, and I think the current environment, as we've all acknowledged, is really challenging for healthcare providers and hospitals in Vermont. And I think we're working together to try to help them through this challenging period and, and deliver better, better value for Vermonters. Um, you know, some of the comments we've heard about the quality measure performance, I think, reflects the struggles that they're having. I think one care and the all payer model are in place to try and help these providers and drive improved outcomes for Vermonters. We have to acknowledge that the world is very different between 2018 and 2023. Um, and some of the measure decline performance you're seeing are the struggles that healthcare providers are having being understaffed and under budgeted to do the work they need to do. Um, you know, unfortunately, the efforts of the ACO can't stem all tides. We're trying to work with the providers to do this work, but it should be remembered that the ACO really is the providers that are in the ACO. It's um, it's not a standalone entity as some other ACOs that are either affiliated with a for-profit entity or um, are trying to aggregate a tremendous volume of uh, providers across the country together. This, these are Vermont providers coming together um, as part of the all-payer model to do this work. And I just want to be clear that the funding Vermont receives is not merely based on the existence of an ACO. The funds are part of the agreement because of the work that OneCare is doing and the measures that are in place. Um, yeah, I think the, the healthcare advocate uh, certainly is well-intentioned and I, I appreciate their feedback. Um, we want to do great work and we want to work with them to address their concerns. Unfortunately, the measures they're introducing uh, and they want to hold accountable, one care accountable to, don't really make sense to me. Um, I'm, I'm trying trying hard to understand them, and I, I, I listened very carefully when um, the gentleman from the healthcare advocates spoke. Uh, I just I don't know that they really um, mesh similar to what Member Walsh said with my understanding of what we're trying to do in the budget. Um, it's really important when you look at ratios to consider what the relationship between the numerator and the denominator is and how you've gotten to those numbers and whether that's truly an indicator of what you're trying to measure. So just to be clear, I don't agree with those ratios. I think as member Walsh pointed out, page 25 of the presentation reflects the reality that I know that is in our budget. Um, and I, I think it's really important also to think about correlation and causation. Um, just because you can draw a comparison doesn't necessarily mean that one thing caused the other. It's a difficult situation in Vermont. I think we all acknowledge that. I think we've got a good plan in our budget that we want to achieve on and measure ourselves on and have you measure us on as to whether we can do uh, that good work and achieve improvements that are quantifiable in 2024. 
Um, so just to sum up, I think we've presented a reasonable and balanced budget that's going to allow us to support the goals of the all-payer model and help our participant network provide value to Vermonters in the coming year. It sustains the funding for the core population health management programs that we have, like CPR and the mental health screening. It also helps expand the use of waivers that cut through red tape for providers. And it puts more emphasis on quality measure and total cost of care performance than it has in prior years. Um, as always, our team's going to work really hard to align incentives around the quintuple aim and break down barriers for providers as they seek to collaborate and innovate. And I, you know, I just want to close by saying One Care's operating budget and our population health management investments comply with the, the Green Mountain Care Board standards. We, this is very intentional. We take what the board says seriously. We tried to incorporate a lot of the recommendations that we've heard over the past 12 months into that budget, and I think it really reflects those efforts. Um, you know, when I read some of the recommended alternatives, I do take great pause. Um, we put a lot of thought into how that budget is constructed, and, and if you um, evaluate it, I, I hope you you take that into account and think about, as Member Lund stated, what uh, the ramifications of radical changes to that budget might be. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Berman. Any other public comment at this time? Okay. Um, why don't we take why don't we take a fifteen minute break? We'll come back at um we'll come back at eleven oh five. And we'll move on to the Medicare only uh, ACOs at 11.05. Uh, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. It looks like we have everyone. Uh, so we'll resume the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of December 6th, and we'll turn to the Medicare only ACOs and uh, Ms. Sawyer for the presentation. Great. Thank you, Chair Foster. I am joined today by our staff attorney, Russ McCracken, to present a few slides as well. The agenda for this afternoon, just touch briefly on the scope of review, and then we'll look at Lore Health's budget. Um, we'll review the public comment that we have received, um, staff recommendations, um, and the potential motion language. And then we'll go right into um, a review of Vitalize Health 9. We have received some additional um, information that we want to review with you all. We want to touch on the uh, public comment. We'll review some staff recommendations, and there will be time for board discussion, um, uh, potential uh, motion language, and of course, at the end, we uh, welcome public comment. So the scope for Medicare only ACO reviews, um, they are not subject to certification um, in Vermont. Smaller ACOs are under a different section of the statute. Um, Lower Health and Vitalized Health 9 have less than 10,000 lives in Vermont. And in previous presentations, we've gone more in depth into what the statute says. So this is just a brief reminder um, both of these ACOs are participating in standard Medicare models with terms that are established under federal rule. And both of these ACOs are multi-state ACOs. So we will start with Lore Health and their FY24 budget. So uh, to date, a single public comment has been received and it is from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, they wanted to share some of their concerns. They include lack of evidence regarding the efficacy of the model of care, a lack of transparency, and their profit priority motive. Recommendations from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate include um, that the board require Laura to submit financial and quality reporting to the board annually, um, for the board to establish a deadline for confidentiality requests in the budget guidance, and that the board should expand the scope of authority over Medicare-only ACOs. So here are some updated staff recommendations. These are very similar to the ones that we reviewed um, previously. Um, the text in red 
is just some updated language, tightening things, some things up, but the intent remains the same behind these recommendations all in all. So I'll talk through them. Recommendation number one, Lower Health provides to the Green Mountain Care Board its shared savings and losses segmented for Vermont. This is a carryover from FY23. Recommendation number two, Lower Health provides an updated version of their Vermont financial summary. The uh, GMCB staff would develop that template and set a deadline. Recommendation number three, Lower Health provides to the Green Mountain Care Board its Medicare Shared Savings Program quality reporting segmented for Vermont, if possible, with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality. Recommendation number four, following three performance years in Vermont, Lower Health provides reporting for those years on uh, GMCB specified metrics, which may include the categories of inpatient medical, inpatient surgical, emergency department, professional office visits, ambulatory care sensitive admissions, and any additional metrics. The GMCB staff would develop the template and metrics and set a deadline. Recommendation number five, Lore Health provides a semi-annual update about how Lore Health's care model is working in Vermont, including any consumer complaints received from attributed Vermont beneficiaries. The um, board staff would develop this template. And the final recommendation is that a representative from Lore Health must engage in an orientation led by the Blueprint for Health within the first quarter of 2024. And just a note on that final recommendation, um, there had been a question during the last time this uh, topic came before the board um, about the availability of these orientations from the Blueprint for Health. And I did touch base with them and they are happy to engage with um, any ACO that would like uh, an orientation on their program. So the suggested motion language for LORE is here. Uh, move that the GMCB approve Lower Health's ACO's 24, uh, FY24 budget as submitted to the board, subject to the conditions reviewed by the board today. So we're going to scoot right along into Vitalize Health 9 ACO. Um, we have received as of December 5th at noon, which was yesterday at noon, 58 public comments. The public comment period ran from November 1st through December 5th at noon. We did extend that public comment period for several ad additional days following feedback from the public that they wanted more time to have their voices heard. Um, so the board welcomes these comments. We encourage the public to engage in its processes. Um, and so here are some of the themes that we heard. Um, there is concern around um, the private equity firms and for-profit motive, um, the concerns around privatization of Medicare, concerns surrounding uh, potential effects on healthcare delivery. Um, there was, as I mentioned, a concern that the public comment period was too short and uh, some public comments around how the board should reject vitalized budget or delay the vote. Um, Little Rivers FQHC, which is one of the participating um, providers in Vitalize's network, um, did submit public comment. They said that they wish to engage with value-based care arrangements and did explore several uh, ACOs. The ACO agreement does allow for disengagement with the ACO at any time um, and that they are... Uh, um, they have signed up to be a part of Vitalized Health as a way um, to ensure their financial health of their practice. The Office of the Healthcare Advocate also submitted public comment. They voiced concerns about the motives of private equity firms or for profit. Um, they are skeptical that Medicare only ACOs, whether they create savings or, or reduce spending, um, they're concerned about the efficacy of the model of care and they're concerned about uh, the Vitalize potentially being a competitor to One Care Vermont. They gave the board a set of recommendations that um, Vitalize Health 9 to submit financial and quality reporting to the Green Mountain Care Board annually, uh, establish deadlines for um, confidentiality requests and budget guidance, 
and that the Green Mountain Care Board should expand the scope of authority over Medicare only ACOs. I wanted to um, just review a, a little bit of new information that we've received from Vitalize um, since we spoke about them last. They had some follow up items that they were going to provide for us, one of them being. Um, uh, a, a chart, an organizational chart. So all the ACOs on the chart are owned in full by Vitalized Health LLC, except for physician leaders, which is an ACO, which Vitalized Health has an investment and operate under a management services agreement. But you can see that they have Vitalized Health 9, as well as um, several other uh, ACOs under different federal models. An update regarding their health equity plan. Um, during the hearing, it was stated that Vitalize Health 9's health equity plan would roll out nationwide in 2024. Um, the ACO provided an update stating that while CMS has approved the plan, uh, in the start of 2024, the initiative will actually be implemented in a single zip code in Mississippi. Um, and, and not nationwide. So if the program is deemed successful, it could be expanded into additional regions. Um, and then they shared some, some example goals around their health equity plan, which has to do with food insecurity. Um, the goals for this initiative include no increase in ED visits um, and inpatient admissions related to complications from food-related chronic illnesses. They also provided um, an update to, to who is included in this provider network. They listed 52 providers were included, and we were curious about what types of providers were in that count. So we have primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, obstetrician gynecologists, certified nurse midwives, clinical social workers, psychiatrists, and dentists were included in that count. And then we'd ask them a question about how their quality withhold was handled. Um, and they stated that it exists, um, it, it is not considered until their final shared savings numbers are received. They are not baked into those PM, PM payments that are going to providers. Um, so they really don't even consider that quality withhold until they're, they're uh, after the end of the program year. Um, of all the support payments made to providers, the priority care program support payments are the only ones not considered an advance in shared savings. I also wanted to touch on some key points, um, especially because there's so much public interest in, um, in Vitalized Health 9. So I wanted to draw some distinctions between Medicare ACOs and Medicare Advantage. Um, a Medicare ACO is different from Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage is an insurance product, and those who choose a Medicare Advantage plan are no longer enrolled in traditional Medicare. The Medicare Advantage company processes, adjudicates, and pays claims. Um, rightfully so, many are wary um, of Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and in, in the case of a Medicare ACO, the ACO works with the provider and with Medicare. A patient is still a beneficiary of traditional Medicare. And even though the funds flow between uh, the way that the funds flow between CMS and the ACO and the ACO and the provider may change. All claims will be processed, adjudicated, and paid by CMS completely outside of the ACO. The ACO itself does not have the ability to deny claims. Um, I also wanted to mention that the ACO REACH program um, is a type of Medicare-only ACO that replaced the global and professional direct contracting model. Um, this program, um, of which Vitalized Health is uh, a participant, is intended to be an improvement upon the previous uh, GPDC model. There have been some valid concerns about participants in that previous model, known as direct contracting entities. And in order to address these concerns, CMS worked to make the following improvements to the ACO REACH model. So 75% of the governing body of a model participant in the ACO REACH must be made up of 
participating providers, whereas in the previous model, that requirement was only 25%. This means that in the ACO reach that on the ground providers are steering the ship for the ACO rather than stakeholders who may, may have any sort of motive. Um, an ACO reach entity must also have a consumer advocate and a beneficiary, both with voting rights on their governing body, and the previous model did not have this requirement. CMS also responded to concerns of patient risk coding abuse by changing from a cap on risk score growth of 3% a year, year over year in the previous model to a 3% cap from a static base year, meaning that if the underlying demographics of an ACO do not change, risk scores can never grow more than 3% during the model performance period. Also, CMS uh, stated that they are prioritizing increased vetting of applicants to the ACO REACH model in comparison uh, with other CMS ACO models and has increased ongoing monitoring of uh, model participants as well. CMS is monitoring uh, model participants in the following ways. Uh, they monitor uh, levels of care act here. They monitor levels of care provided to make sure that um, the ACOs aren't skimping on beneficiary care. CMS conducts uh, compliance audits, uh, audits throughout the year, uh, investigating beneficiary complaints, um, and conducts beneficiary experience surveys, the CAP surveys annually, um, to ensure there isn't a change in beneficiary satisfaction. They also monitor whether or not beneficiaries aligned to the ACO, ACO are being moved out of traditional Medicare and into Medicare um, ad Advantage. Um, I would, I'm would i going to pass it over to Russ for this slide to walk us through a couple additional points, including um, the, the Green Mountain Care Board's um, process in reviewing these budgets. Um, thanks, Michelle. So just a couple of further points to kind of round out what Michelle was saying, and then I'll talk about the board's authority. Um, the first is under the <clears throat> REACH model, um, beneficiaries have the option of opting out of the data sharing. So CMS may share um, aggregated claims data. Um, about financial performance and uh, quality for an ACO and beneficiaries can call CMS and opt out of that, having their claims data uh, shared in that way. Um, just, just to make the point clearly, you know, an ACO enters the market through um, finding uh, providers who want to participate with that ACO. Um, it's not a decision that ACO can make on its own. It's a joint agreement with a provider, um, and it's voluntary for the provider, and it um, is usually done on a year-to-year -year basis, so the provider could back out, <clears throat> depending on how the provider's experience with the ACO goes. Uh, so a couple of things about what the board's authority is in this particular space. Uh, relative to ACOs that have contracts only with Medicare. And in these cases, there are also ACOs with fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in the state. <clears throat> so it's very explicit in the statute that ACOs that only have Medicare contracts are not required to be certified by the board. Uh, under Section 9382A, certification is only required for an ACO to receive Medicaid funds or commercial funds. So what we're left with here is the budget review, where as we look at the statute and the rule, the board is tasked with reviewing, modifying, and approving budgets, which is unlike the certification where the board may either approve, provisionally approve with conditions, or deny a certification application. So under the current statute and rule, the board does not have authority to prevent a Medicare-only ACO from entering into the state. Uh, the authority for the board to prevent an ACO from operating in Vermont uh, falls under the certification uh, provision, which you know explicitly isn't required for the Medicare-only ACOs. Um, 
I'd also note I, this is <clears throat> consistent with the enforcement provisions in the board's ACO oversight rule. Um, those enforcement provisions set remedial actions that ultimately could culminate in the revocation of certification. So if we think about the kind of ultimate enforcement as stopping an ACO from participating or operating in the state, uh, the rule sets that up, you know, that ability to stop the ACO from operating in the state as revoking the ACO certification. Um, I also want to note here, as the board considers the budgets of these ACOs, there are quite a few programmatic elements of the REACH model or the MSSP model, um, depending on which ACO we're looking at, that are set by CMS. Um, and those are elements that are outside of the board's authority to change. There are um, provisions that are determined by CMS in uh, its rules and regulations. <clears throat> um, so, you know, making a similar point to that, the board is regulating the ACO conduct in Vermont. We're not regulating an ACO's operations in other states. So what we're left with here is using the budget modification uh, authority and um, some broad kind of reporting authority that the board has <clears throat> under the ACO oversight rule to require reporting and regulation uh, reporting and um, so monitoring provisions of ACOs. Uh, and based on that authority, we've uh, crafted some staff recommendations. <clears throat> that Michelle is going to walk through, um, which are sort of designed to um, help the board uh, monitor the financial and quality performance and results of the ACO um, in the state. Uh, so Michelle, I will turn it back to you, I think. Thank you. So I already spoke verbally to um, some of the safeguards that CMS has in place, but this slide has them here in writing if anybody would like to refer back to this. So here are some updated staff recommendations for Vitalize Health. They may seem uh, a little familiar. So recommendation one, Vitalize Health 9 provides the Green Mountain Care Board its shared savings and losses segmented for Vermont. Recommendation two, Vitalized Health provides an updated version of their Vermont financial summary staff, uh, GMCV staff to develop the template and set the deadline. Recommendation three, Vitalized Health Night uh, Nine provides the Green Mountain Care Board its ACO reach quality reporting segmented for Vermont if possible with appropriate restrictions to protect patient confidentiality. Recommendation four, Following three performance years in Vermont, Vitalize Health 9 provides reporting for those years on GMCB specific, specified metrics, which may include the categories of inpatient medical, inpatient surgical, emergency department, professional office visits, ambulatory care sensitive admissions, and any other additional metrics. GMCB staff to develop the template and metrics and set a deadline. Recommendation five. Vitalize Health 9 provides a semi-annual update, the first support su report submitted with their FY25 budget submission on October 1st, 2024, about how Vitalize Health 9's care model is working in Vermont, including any consumer complaints received from attributive Vermont beneficiaries. GMCB staff to develop the template. And the final recommendation, a representative from Vitalize Health 9 must engage in an orientation led by the Blueprint for Health within the first quarter of 2024. Here I have some suggested motion language. Move that the GMCB approve Vitalize Health 9 ACO's FY24 budget as submitted to the board subject to the conditions reviewed by the board today. And at this point, I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you both very much. Um, I'll open it up to the board members for question and comment, and then 
Uh, we can see if anyone wants to make either of the motions, but I guess we'll take some board member discussion first or questions if there are any. Let me just ask one question. Um, on recommendation five for both of the Medicare only ACOs, I'm wondering if there's any value in expanding the uh, gathering of information about consumer complaints beyond just Vermont. So asking for all consumer complaints, not just those in Vermont, just to the degree that we can learn from what's happening in other states with these um, ACOs. So just a question for the staff on that one. I don't see any obvious um, obstacles to to expanding that recommendation to include consumer complaints um, from their network of national beneficiaries. I don't see a problem there. Um, Ms. Swear, one, which is, are we aware, are there any investigations or litigations or any sort of findings of any problems with either of these ACOs to our knowledge? Not to our knowledge, no. Okay. I, I have a, a comment um, that really is a reflection on reading a lot of the public comments which is I, I, I hear the real concern of profiteering and healthcare delivery. Um, and I, I'm very profoundly bothered by aggressive business tactics, whether it be for-profit or non-profit within, within healthcare. Um, but, and this is challenged because I, I really do believe that really the soul of, this may sound a little, tacky, but I, I, I'm honest with it, that I believe the soul of medicine is the art of medicine and that that real artful practice of medicine is most exemplified by the primary care patient provider relationship where there's trust, where there's understanding, where there's um, comfort in having that relationship over time. And, and I, I, I'm a firm believer that that really helps people live healthier, it helps people live happier. I think it probably reduces the cost of care, reduces unnecessary testing. I think there's literature to support that. Um, so I guess my concern, my bigger concern with primary care is the opportunity to have that relationship is being eroded by the challenges that are facing providers of primary care and, and patients accessing primary care, whether it be through the burdens on primary care providers through prior authorization or compliance or um, reimbursements that are just really not keeping pace with the cost of delivering primary care. So I think, I hope that the, the ACOs that are um, so the primary care providers, the practices, the FQHCs that are joining these various ACOs are doing so, I think they're doing so because they need the financial support to continue to provide high quality health care to their communities. And I, I understand the frustration of that, um, that there's profit going away from Vermont uh, to these organizations, but at the same time, it, it appears to me that these the, the Vermont organizations are benefiting substantially with their mission of trying to deliver the care they're delivering. So that, that's just my my general comment on on these ACOs. Thank you. Yeah, this is Tom and um, um, go ahead, Tom. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to just briefly echo uh, Dr. Merman. The thing that struck me most from the numerous <clears throat> several dozen public comments we got was were the 
frustrations with um, not even profiteering per se, but a focus on finance over people and how um, frustrated that is for Vermont, frustrating that is for Vermonters um, and how much stress that adds. Um, some of the concerns that were raised um, caused me to really reflect on my understanding of what the ACO REACH model does. Um, and so I, I double and triple checked, and I want to thank Michelle and her staff for double and triple checking. Um, this new model seeks to address concern, many of the concerns of past models, and um, specifically limiting networks, upcoding, cherry picking, governance by administrators. Um, this the reach model specifically addresses those. And really tries to take the features that have worked with ACOs that have worked. Um, those include keeping it small, keeping it focused and having it be provider led. Um, and providers in Vermont have selected to join these ACOs because they think it will help them care for their patients. Um, so. I think that's important for us to reflect on. It's also important for us on the board to read the comments and hear the frustration in our community. Um, and I did, and I want to acknowledge that I read them and I heard it. I don't have anything else to add that others haven't already said. I do think the recommendations uh, do a good job of staying within our scope, admittedly limited though it be, and uh, ensuring transparency and monitoring. So I appreciate all the work, Michelle and Russ, that you've put into it. Thanks. Um, could you put up the motion language again, Ms. Sawyer, if you, if you can? Would you prefer the one for lore or the one for vitalize? Um, vitalize, I guess, since we're here and close okay. to it. Oh, um, Mr. McCracken. <clears throat> this is a quick thing. I, I um, just wanted to note member homes change in one of the conditions. So um, <clears throat> the motion language would be changed slightly to say something uh, along the lines of <clears throat> uh, conditions reviewed by the for board today with those changes um, discussed by the board today. So we can make yes. uh, member homes change in the final uh, version. Yep, great. And thanks. And I agreed with member Holmes's change and it. I think that makes sense to broaden that. <clears throat> um, uh, so I'll move that the GMCB approve vitalized health nine ACOs fiscal year 24 budget as submitted to the board subject to the conditions uh, reviewed by the board today and as modified by member Holmes's suggestion. A second. Did we lose the chair? He looks oh, frozen. I'm, oh. I'm still here. I didn't hear a second though. Oh, Tom seconded. Oh, okay. I might have glitched out for a second. Um, okay, great. Well, so we have a second. Thank you very much. Um we can go through any board comments on the motions. I'm not sure there will be much. Um, I will just thank Michelle and um uh, Russ for walking us through and reminding us of where our authorities lie and the context of this review. Um, so with that, is there any other board comment or discussion on the motion? Okay. Uh, hearing none, I'll turn to the HCA as to whether or not they have any additional comment. Yeah, thanks, Chair Foster. Just a brief one. Um, also wanted to reiterate and thank everyone that submitted public comments. It's probably no surprise that we think this engagement is important. 
and helpful. Um, I also want to thank Michelle and Russ. We agree with the staff recommendations and also with member Holmes suggestion. I think that's a good one. And we also agree with the board's analysis that currently at present, the board doesn't have the power to deny a Medicare only ACO from operating in the state. I think for us, what that unfortunately presents the board is a dynamic of essentially voluntary compliance with regulation by these entities. I mean, I think what we worry about is these well thought out recommendations. Entities like Lore or Vitalize could simply choose to not comply with them. And I think the board's lack of authority is something that the board could address through a rulemaking process uh, that we outlined in our comment. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll open up to public comment. Uh, Ms. Wasserman. Yes, thank you, um, Julie Wasserman here. I guess my comment is um, more overarching. I, I concur with uh, all of uh, HCA's thoughts and comments. Um, I, I guess my one comment would be that we've got problems in Vermont when FQH when FQHCs need to resort to this model. And I think that this um, discussion and the actions um, are uh, point to um, some serious problems in terms of the way Vermont treats primary care. And um, I'm hoping the uh, Green Mountain Care Board maybe in the future can address the, some of these issues so that other FQHCs and other primary care practices, independent ones, won't be forced or have to resort to a for-profit model just to um, just to maintain their existence. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I saw you come on camera. Did you have a comment? <laughs> hey, Owen. Hey. Uh, a couple. <laughs> To your question about litigation with Vitalize, uh, Dr. Marvin Malik sent in a commentary that I read. I read those public comments too about the history of the founders of Vitalize, which was really pretty telling about their motives. I agree with the ACA that these people can just skirt regulations for recommendations, you know, whenever they want to. Um, and I agree with Julie on her comments about the private <laughs> motives of the private enter, uh, firms and the state of primary care. And I also want to back up what Dave said about the relationships. As a patient, it's always strained about <clears throat> Because you know these private companies are coming in, calling you, you know, managing, trying to manage your care, and then billing it to Medicare, and then you wind up getting billed yourself for something you didn't know about. Because it's all about the money right now. It really isn't anything about the patient per se anymore. It's how much the patient is a source of revenue. And I don't see. <clears throat> I wish the board did have the authority to knock back vitalized or lore because I don't see them doing anything really for us except siphoning out our dollars. <laughs> but I did want to back Dave up on that comment because as a patient, it's really hard right now. Great. Thank, thank you, Walter. Uh, Mr. Barter, and um, I, I'll just try to introduce people from where they're affiliated with, and I believe um, you're the CEO of uh, Little Rivers. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, that's that's correct. Um, I, I wanted to thank the CARE Board and um, all those that participated in the public comments. Um, we, we appreciate what's been discussed and we hear the concerns and the public comments they're helpful for us as we um, find our way i also want to reassure that 
um, no external entity will intervene with patient-centered care here directed by our providers um, solely. Um, that will never change and um, uh, we hold to that. Um, I also wanted to give just a, a quick story on how we got here in terms of our health center. Um, I could give a long story, <laughs> a short one with respect to everyone's time. Uh, our understanding historically has been that our particular health center due to geography and the health service areas may not be ideally or practically aligned with uh, programming at one care. Um, and so we, we ended up in a situation where we haven't been a participant in, in value-based care transformation and with One Care Vermont um, and haven't um, had that component of um, to help us with, with quality and um, and also with the sources of revenue that are that come with that. And um, so we we did uh, engage uh, with um, set up activities with Vitalize this year um, in anticipation of participation, uh, some or all of next year. Um, our engagement it may be termed at any time. Um, I think we're both presumably motivated to um, follow the morals and the ethics of Little Rivers Healthcare, but if by any reason we deviate from that, then we will discontinue our participation. I also want to, to share that we um, have engaged directly with Green Mountain Care Board um, on, on, uh, in some conversations and, and anticipate continuing on that path. Um, and we have met with um, a Berman and Carrie Wolfman from One Care Vermont, and we're very hopeful to, um, it's our understanding that the Comprehensive Payment Reform Program may be um, extending from private practices to FQHCs in the course of 2024. So I just wanted everyone to know that we're, we're thankful for all the conversation. We're committed to our patients. We want to be part of the movement in Vermont with Vermonters, and um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for providing the public comment to give the board a little more information, um, and thank you for all the public comment that we did receive. It was well done and informative and uh, made the board really look hard at this, so thank you. Any other public comment? Um, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, and the motion carries unanimously. Um, Ms. Sawyer, would you mind pulling up the staff recommendation for lore real quick, and then we can go to the motion language. Member Holmes, would you want to expand um, number five as to these recommendations as well? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Um, if you could pull up the motion, please. I move that the Green Mountain Care Board approve Lower Health's ACO, Lower Health ACO's fiscal year 24 budget as submitted to the board, subject to the conditions reviewed by the board today and as modified by member Holmes. Second. And is there any board discussion? Um, does the healthcare advocate have any uh, comment on the lower health motion? Nothing else, thank you. And is there any public comment? Okay. 
Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Um, I think that's all we had on the agenda today. Um, so I'll ask whether there's any new or old business to come before the board. And a, a big thank you to our staff who really worked extra hours the last month and really last week on these presentations uh, to provide the board a lot of information, a lot of things to think about and consider as we evaluate the one care budget going forward. Um, I appreciate that very, very much. And I thought the presentations were very, very helpful to frame our thinking as we uh, move towards the uh, vote and deliberations. Um, seeing there's no new or old business, is there a motion to adjourn? Yes, I move to adjourn. I will second it and all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries and we are adjourned. Thank you and have a good afternoon.